All right. Thank you uh, all for attending today. Many familiar faces, and I wanted to welcome you to the April Washington Ideas Roundtable at the Aspen Institute. We're particularly grateful to the Michelle Smith and the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation for making both today's event and this whole series possible. Today's event will be on the record and live streamed at aspeninstitute.org. And it will also be possible to find in cyber. This is new to me, coming from government. <laughs> but I guess nowadays there's a lot of tweeting uh, in government. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to briefly describe the Aspen Institute cyber program. This is one of our uh, inaugural events. This is our second uh, roundtable here at the Institute. This is a new program that really was the uh, genius and brainchild of Walter Isaacson who for years has been recognizing the importance of cyber and technology issues and driving the Aspen Institute to create a new program focusing just on those issues, how they, uh, what the threat looks like, and to be as creative as we can in thinking through potential policy solutions. And since we've launched the program, it does seem like there's been a fair amount of talk uh, about cyber. So as usual, Walter was ahead of the curve in spotting this, spotting this threat, the need for a program. The, uh, and I also wanted to thank uh, our distinguished guests at, uh, today. Their bios are in the program. Uh, we will start with a discussion period with the guests and then open it up to questions. And I thought I'd start a little bit uh, with a discussion of there was a hearing yesterday uh, there was? that I'm sure no nobody court, no. spotted. <laughs> and we didn't plan this, but uh, we have the two individuals here who worked for the two people who were testifying um, yesterday. And there was a little bit of news made something about uh, the director of the FBI confirming a counterintelligence investigation, um, confirming that Russians had actually, through cyber-enabled means, interfered with our election, undermined confidence in the integrity of our electoral system. The uh, director of the National Security Agency said specifically what was new about this attack was the use of stolen information, stolen through cyber-enabled means to influence an election. And there also was discussion as to whether or not there was any supporting evidence about a uh, wiretap of Trump Tower. So we will not be talking about that. Uh, <laughs> but what I did want to emphasize was something that hasn't gotten as much discussion that's extraordinarily significant. And that is the director of the FBI and the head of the National Security Agency testified before Congress that Russia is going to attempt to interfere with our presidential elections in 2020, and that they may do so in 2018. So in the same hearing where they said that through cyber-enabled attacks, uh, Russia attempted to undermine confidence in our democracy in this electoral cycle, that there are concerns they're going to do the same in Europe, that it's consistent with the trade pattern. They also sent out an alarm bell that said, we are going to be under attack. So I think one of the key questions today is knowing what the threat is, what are we going to do about it? And maybe I'll start there and turn to Rick Leggett for a description of what that threat and other threats look like. What should we be most concerned about. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. Appreciate it. And thanks to everybody uh, for the opportunity. Happy to be here. And I think uh, both uh, both Admiral Rogers and Director Comey deserve kudos for surviving a five and a half hour open hearing yesterday. That's pretty, uh, pretty remarkable. Um, so the, the uh, there's, there's no question that the Russians were, were behind the, uh, the hacks related around the, uh, the U.S. election. That's been well documented in the unclassified intelligence community assessment, and the proof is uh, irrefutable. The, um, the, the trend, and it goes back several years, including to internal Russian elections back in uh, 2010 and 2011, and elections in surrounding uh, countries and in what the Russians call the near abroad, 
um, and the continuing to this day efforts to influence uh, elections in uh, in Western Europe in countries that the Russians care about is a fact of life. And, and what actually happened is that it's an extrapolation of things that they did going back to the to the days, for those of us who started off as Cold Warriors and the days of disinformatia. Um, what this has given them is a new platform for doing it that, that makes it easier, faster, um, gives them ready access to more information that they can then use in the way that they use the, uh, the, the DNC data um, to help shape public opinion in the uh, in the areas uh, the uh, countries in which they're they're trying to do this influence. So, it's historically something they've done. Um, it's become easier, and it's going to continue. And it's hard to detect, and it's hard to um, to defend against, especially in countries like ours where free speech uh, is a core value. Do you think our electoral system is secure? And if not? What can we do between now and the 2018 or 2020 elections to secure it? So I think, uh, based on what I know, and I'm not an expert on the electoral system, we're focused externally, not internally. Um, the, uh, the, the system it was not uh, significantly affected. Uh, part of that is because it's not a system. It's a whole bunch of systems, and there's not a one place that you could go to, to to affect outcomes. You would have to go to 50 places to affect outcomes. And so um, my colleagues at DHS probably have more information on, on uh, that because they were involved. I do think it, it begs the question of, should we designate the elect election-related systems as critical infrastructure? And should we? I, I think so, yes. As, a, as an American who votes, yes. Uh, I want to ask you about what you think the top threats are. Is, is the top threat the threat posed by nation states? Is the threat one uh, about attacking our core values, things like the electoral system or the right of uh, a motion picture company to make a movie? Is it uh, potential death or destruction through attacks on our critical infrastructure? Is it the crime that we see day in, day out? So, so as we look at this, uh, there's there's three bins that we put these things in from a national security point of view. There is there are things associated with set, with theft that could be um, espionage, state sponsored espionage. It could be economic or industrial espionage. Um, it could be uh, criminal uh, activities, high end uh, uh, criminals that have nation state like uh, capabilities. Um, and so, from a theft point of view, uh, stealing of our secrets. Um, stealing of our intellectual property, the loss of economic competitiveness, that's a national security issue in my view. Um, second bin we put things in is denial. Denial of service, denial of access to information includes uh, um, things like the Iranian attacks against the U.S. financial sector. Um, it includes things like ransomware. It includes things like attacks on data, on the integrity of the data, so it's denying you access to accurate uh, data. And that attacks on the integrity of data is something that we're increasingly uh, worried about because that's actually in some ways worse than not get letting you have access to the data. You have access to data that you think is good, but it's actually not. And the third thing is the destructive attacks. Um, the, uh, the things like, um, like the uh, attack uh, on Saudi Aramco in 2012 that's been attributed to the, uh, to the Iranians in the press and the attacks in South Korea that have been attributed to North Korea in the press. Um, one thing that's that's a little bit new in this space that I wanted to highlight in the first category, the theft, is um, if you look at so the attack on Sony's picture, Sony Pictures Entertainment that, that was, um, again, uh, Paul's organization and mine were involved in the attribution of that, and the attribution is rock solid. That was the North Korean government. Um, in the private sector cybersecurity uh, arena, they have linked that malware via a group that they call Lazarus to the uh, the uh, theft of, attempted theft of $950 million from a bank in Bangladesh by attacking the SWIFT uh, uh, messaging system that, uh, that controls the flow of data back and forth. And they successfully stole something like $100 million, and folks at the Fed in New York managed to stop the remaining $850 million when they saw some, some aberration in the messages. But if that attribution is true, if that linkage from Sony actors to the Bangladeshi bank actors is accurate, that means a nation state is robbing banks. That's a big deal, in my view. That's different. And do you believe that there are nation states now robbing banks? Is that your assessment? I do. And so if you're a private company, um, whether a bank 
or another company, and you're up against nation states and organized criminal groups, what are you to do? That's a great question. Um, I, I think that's an open question. Um, Penny Pritzker, who was the former Secretary of Commerce, was quoted as saying that cyber is the only domain in which we rely on individual corporate entities to stand up against nation states like Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And it's the it's the equivalent of if they if they launch an actual physical attack against, say, Home Depot or Target, you hope that the security guys at Home Depot and Target can stop the North Korean army. That's on the face of it doesn't make any sense. So um, I think that's something where, where the government needs to figure out uh, what the right answer to that is. And uh, that. Rick, we've uh, had the opportunity to work together for for many years, and I remember vividly after the North Korean attacks on Sony that you felt very strongly that there needed, even though it was about a motion picture company, which is not critical infrastructure, mm -hmm. that there needed to be a public, not only a public attribution, but a public response mm -hmm. that sent a message, not just to North Korea, but all the other countries watching. Do you think that our responses to date are sufficient? And if not, what should we do to take a more aggressive posture in government? I think we have to build to, uh, to a, a better responses. I don't think we're there yet. I think we've, we've been putting out building blocks, things like economic sanctions, things like, uh, actually, John, under your leadership, some of the indictments of foreign cyber actors, the three PLA officers, the, um, the Iranian uh, folks associated with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps last year, and then most recently the Russian, uh, the Russians associated with uh, Federal Security Service uh, indictments. Um, so things like that, things like economic sanctions directed against them, things like um, um, holding other things that countries care about at risk for the cyber activities that they do. I think those are all components, and we haven't figured out how to do that all, uh, you know, to a requisite level. But I think we've got building blocks there to, to start with. And let me turn there to you, uh, Paul. Um, as the lead official at the FBI overseeing the cyber division and the FBI's response to cyber threats, uh, if a company is hacked today, well, let me start here. If your house is broken into today, people know to call 911. If a company uh, faces ransomware or, as we've just uh, rather chillingly heard from the Deputy Director of the NSA, if nation states are robbing banks, what is the Cyber 911 number that they should call? Jen, thank, first of all, thank you uh, for having me here today. It's a privilege to be here with you all. Um, I, I think, John, you know, it starts in advance of an incident actually happening. Um, it's all about building those partnerships between government and the private sector, private industry, before something happens, and building that relationship, building the trust, and sharing two-way sharing of information to be preventative. We're, we're, not, we're certainly not there yet. We're a long way from where we want to be. Um, but that's what I see as the focal point of that, that relationship building and cooperation uh, between the two to be preventative in nature and then mitigate and respond if necessary. In the ordinary course of business daily, um, if a company or an individual private citizen, whoever feels that they've been victimized, we would want them to first and foremost, um, assuming there's no imminent danger or threat of, to life or, or uh, health, we would want them to call one of our local FBI offices and our cyber task force uh, personnel would respond and engage from there. And let's set expectations because um, talking to many companies who've been victims, some of whom are here today, what should they expect when they call that local FBI field office? Are they gonna get an officer to come to their door and help uh, get their system back up and running? Are they gonna get someone to show up and even take the equivalent of a police report? And if not, what is it, is there some other number that they should call or what should be expected of them? We, we need the intel and information first and foremost so we can evaluate it, blend it with everything else we have in our holdings, all their incident reports, and see if there is who is behind it and if there's a bigger picture involved, the extent of the damage or economic harm or loss, and then build it out from there. Again, I think that all goes back to being proactive and preventing bad things 
from happening, would, would, from happening, which is our number one goal, of course. But again, it goes back to the pre-existing relationship. Uh, we really need that, um, particularly between those companies that possess or own the critical infrastructure within our, within our nation, um, the largest of companies, uh, those that have the most to lose. We need to have those relationships uh, in order to prevent, uh, you know, the worst uh, possible scenarios from occurring in advance. And then, again, if it's uh, something daily, bu daily business, uh, routine action, we would want you to call our office. Um, I assure you um, we will take any and all reports and information. We need that, again, to build out um, the bigger picture. And um, we would take it on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis from there in terms of the level and priority of the response that we would give to a particular incident. Uh, you announced, as Rick referenced, some significant uh, charges last week that involved Russian activity. And one question uh, I wanted to ask you is, what do you take away from that if you're a potential victim, uh, a company or individual? Should be, how do you tell whether you're under attack by a nation state or a criminal group? Uh, that, John, I think that speaks to the sort of the nature of the threat we're facing today. It's uh, really a blended threat or a hybrid threat or call it a crossover uh, threat. It's a coming together and a working together of nation state uh, actors, uh, state sponsors, and criminal hackers. So we saw that, as you highlighted last week, uh, with the announcement of the Yahoo indictments and everything that's behind uh, that particularly in particular investigation, we saw a coming together of officers of the FSB, uh, one of the Russian state services, and ordinary uh, but very sophisticated criminal ha hackers, and the state leveraging those criminal hackers to affect the intrusion uh, into Yahoo and all the further uh, criminal actions that happen from there. And um, the, I, again, I think that heightens the threat we're facing. I look at everything we're talking about here in the cyber arena, the cyber realm, is really a reflection of real life and all the crime and bad things and bad outcomes that could possibly happen. Uh, but now through the anonymity and the reach of um, the cyber world, um, it just raises the threat. And then the, inter the ability of those actors state-sponsored, terrorist, uh, ordinary criminals, transnational criminal organizations to interact and potentially leverage each other and actually leverage each other as they did in the Yahoo case, um, raise the risk of harm to an even greater level. So if I'm hearing you, you right, as we move to cyber, you have all the same bad actors, uh, crooks, terrorists, spies, rogue nation states, doing what they would do in the real world in cyber, but you're also saying it's worse because they have an ability to uh, work together and hit U.S. companies in a way that you wouldn't be able to do if it wasn't cyber, cyber means. So a rather, chilling, uh, a rather chilling portrait. Let me ask, because it's a lot easier to ask questions, uh, and I'm enjoying this new role right? <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to, to answer them. <laughs> the, uh, what, uh, so what are you going to do about it if you have in the real world when it's a when it's a crook, for instance, you can go exercise your authorities, the F FBI, and arrest them? But let's talk about Russia. I mean, you have here a, a country that is both, according to the director of the FBI, both has interfered with an election through committing crimes, stealing information, and then uh, releasing it through cyber-enabled means, is going to do it again in 2020. And you have that same country, um, in, including the charges you announced last week, that seemingly is harboring crooks, not just committing national security events, but routinely harboring crooks. So uh, I assume it's difficult to send an agent over there to knock on a door and arrest and bring someone home. What are you going to do about it? Well, as, as we've said, it's a grave threat. It's an elevated threat. But uh, I also see in that, in that realm, as Rick pointed out, I mean, it's, it's nothing in the course of history we've always faced spying and foreign intelligence activities and economic espionage, but again, it's heightened, it's allowed um, actors to work 
together and form networks that we haven't faced in the past. It's more complex and challenging to unravel that, uh, and it allows them greater reach and anonymity. Uh, I would go back to what another thing that Rick said. We need to leverage all of the tools uh, between and among us that are available um, and leverage all the you know, resources and capabilities and authorities of our agencies and the interagency and even bring that down to the state and local level uh, where appropriate uh, in order to form that defense, uh, be offensive uh, in some cases and really, uh, and really push back. I mean, that's what it comes down to. So like everything on the front end, it's the intel and information sharing to be proactive and preventative, and then it's leveraging all the tools, resources, and options we have to stop, push back, and prevent. And that would include arrests, indictments, uh, economic sanctions, and everything else that we've mentioned up here thus far. Rick, I might turn to you there and ask. Um, Paul talked about leveraging all the available tools and resources. Do we have sufficient uh, legal tools and resources both to respond to victims in a coherent way and then to take action that will influence and change the behavior of a nation state like Russia? Yeah, I think um, uh, the, the first category in terms of, of assisting victims in, in our um, piece of that pie, uh, we provide technical assistance uh, either directly to um, owners of national security systems, which are all classified systems of the U.S. government or things that are essential for military or intelligence related functions like the unclassified DOD network. Um, in all the other cases, we would operate under a request for technical assistance from either the Bureau or from the Department of Homeland Security. And so it's sort of an indirect uh, engagement. And our role in that place is typically to help them understand what happened and then potentially provide advice on reconstitution and recovery um, and then future security. Kick them out and help help them stay out. Um, one one little anecdote about that, if I can, if I can uh, be permitted, is um, about a year and a half ago there was an intrusion into an unclassified national security system um, and there's a nation state actor who gotten in and what we saw for the very first time, actually this was late 2015, what we saw for the very first time was um, the adversary, instead of, you know, once we detected them, instead of disappearing, they fought back. And so it was basically hand-to-hand -hand combat in a network where we were, we would take an action, they would then counter that, uh, say we removed their command and control uh, uh, channel to the, to the malware, to the code that they were running, they would counter that by introducing a new command and control channel. And, and we had the advantage of, it's actually one of the advantages NSA brings to this is, our defenders also have access to our foreign intelligence capabilities, and so which are out in, in adversary space. And so we were able to see them teeing up new things to do. And so if you're the if you're the defender and you see what the adversary is going to do, then that's a really useful capability to have. But there was a series; it was about a 24-hour period of you know parry, repost, parry, repost, uh, measure, countermeasure, counter, countermeasure, and so forth. Um, and so uh, that was new. That's a that's a new level of interaction between. Um, a cyber attacker and a, and a defender. And so it was a little bit of a game changer. And I tell that story because um, it means that the current model doesn't really scale of, of you know, sending out you know, government teams to fix the problems. That, that doesn't scale in an environment like that. And so we need to figure out how do we leverage private industry, the private sector, in a way that, that equips them with information that we have to do to, to make that a fair fight between them and the attacker. Um, uh, and then, um, on terms of the uh, you know tools of the government to to respond and to cause foreign nation states to alter their behavior, um, I don't think there's any magic as to the tools. I think it has to be a will to apply the tools and a realization that the um, you know the potential second and third order effects of applying those tools to a foreign nation state are worth it from a, what we gain from a cyber point of view. And I think increasingly people are coming to appreciate that, yeah, it might be that the thing we would do to, um, you know, one, one thing that was talked about, it was, it was never done to my knowledge, is um, when, uh, when China was accused of uh, theft of intellectual property in particular sectors is to say, okay, if you steal out of that sector, you don't get to compete in the United States in that sector anymore. Chinese companies are barred from that. So that never happened. There were lots of reasons that that didn't happen. But, but those sorts of discussions, those sorts of calculus uh, 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 equations need to be part of the discussion going forward. 
Do you, uh, the United Kingdom just announced several weeks ago the creation of a new cyber center, a, a one-stop shop essentially where a company could go and know that they're going to get the full resources of the British government. And that center is dedicated to helping collect intelligence and prevent the threat. It doesn't, uh, as far as I know, have any regulatory authority to take action against the company for not having uh, proper defenses, nor does it have any obligation to inform the regulatory arms of the British uh, government if a company comes forward and asks for their help. We don't have a similar body inside the United States, should we? Uh, I, I do think so. Um, it might not be an exact uh, lift and shift model because of the UK model, different governmental model, and they're also smaller, which, which gives them an advantage in that space. But I think every study we've ever done of how government responds to cyber boils down to two things. We need two things. We need integration and we need agility. I think you can make a pretty compelling case that the current way that we do that has neither of those, um, at least without heroic efforts. And, and um, a, a, uh, a colleague of mine used the analogy that um, the current model is your house catches on fire, you call the mayor to see if he'll let you call the water department to ask them to turn on the water, and then you go to the city council to get funding so the fire department can send a truck to your house, and by the time that happens, your cyber house is burning <coughs> to the ground. And so, so that model clearly is not one that's gonna be successful going forward, and so we need, we need something different, and, and I think the idea of having an entity that has people that leverage the authorities of all the different components of the government and can apply those authorities without having to go back to headquarters and ask for a mother may I each time within some kind of constraints is something that has merit. Um, and another thing in that space is, uh, you know, currently it's very difficult for the largest cadre of cybersecurity knowledge in the U.S. government, which is in the Department of Defense in both NSA and Cybercom, it's really difficult to apply that to the private sector or to critical infrastructure. And so any solution that doesn't let that happen with some degree of agility while respecting all the, the appropriate you know, roles of the military and roles of the intelligence community, um, in my mind, is fundamentally flawed. So, Paul, uh, your colleague just said that we have currently have neither the agility nor capability needed to respond to cyber threats. Uh, no pressure, Paul. <laughs> that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> Uh, I should I should also mention uh, that Rick, after a long and distinguished uh, career, has announced his retirement. So we're getting to hear. <laughs> yeah, I'm, trying, I'm trying to behave. Yeah. Um, but I, I do not think he's alone. And uh, I've recently joined uh, private practice and left government as well, and working at uh, Morrison Forster and responding to. Uh, clients who are companies who have been victimized, I hear the same thing again and again, whether it's ransomware, whether it's being on the front lines of things like mm -hmm. nation states robbing banks or other blended threats, that they don't feel right now the government has the sufficient resources or place that they can go to get the help they need given what the threat is. Do you agree? And if not, why not? And if you do agree, what or what should we do to make sure we have that capability? Well, these gentlemen it seems like they're in a safe space. <laughs> Throwing me out here now. Uh, so I, you know, we 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 always need to think about and work toward improving and getting better and being more efficient and effective at what we do it, in, across all threats. You know, cyber being the one that we're discussing here uh, today. Um, in terms of resourcing and funding and, and all the things that go along with that, um, you know, it would be easy to say we don't have enough or we never have enough, but I also think it's a matter of expectations um, and, you know, prioritization in terms of what we have to use. Um, so in, this, in the, the idea of having uh, one central Cyber Center, again, I think we should look at that model and consider it and learn from it from our, you know, close partners uh, in, the, in the UK. And it is something that might be worth moving toward uh, at some point. It's certainly, I would say, that parts of all of our organizations uh, always need to work to come together in a better way in terms of coordination, collaboration, because uh, by doing that, we'll be best positioned to stop the threat, um, you know, before 
uh, it hits us. Um, the, the other aspect of this is, you know, we're very focused here in the discussion today on the national security side and, you know, nation, state sponsors and state actors. But, you know, from our perspective, we're looking at everything. Again, I think, like I said, it's a reflection of the world we live in. So when we look at the cyber realm, we have to think of, like, ordinary crimes as well and how we deal with that in the cyber world, building upon what's happen happening in reality. So that goes toward child predators operating online, uh, um, the perpetration of financial frauds and various schemes like that. And uh, it, frankly, it is challenging, I think, at every level, federal, state, local, with our law enforcement resources um, to deal with the volume that we face out there. And it does come back to a matter of prioritization of resources and funding toward that to put us in the best position to counter that in collaboration with all of our partners. And we're never where we want to be. We, we wouldn't be there unless all crime was ended, you know. But that's probably not a reality, although I hope for that. Um, so it, it's just a constant process of evol evolving, improving, and getting better at what we do and, and you know, stewarding the resources that we have uh, in the best way we can and learning from that. I mean, with that, start uh, turning it over to the round table for uh, questions. Maybe I'll start with Walter. Um, I have two quick questions, if you don't mind. One is, when you said we need a unified and flexible, especially since we have to go on offense sometimes when somebody fights back, uh, do you think it is then not wise to split Cyber Command from the NSA? You know, I think uh, I think there's there's almost universal agreement that cyber and they say they do need to split at some point. I think the question is when, um, and so is it a time-based activity? Is it a conditions-based activity? I would argue for the latter, mm -hmm. um, but I'd put a boundary on the time so that it's not you know five years from now having the same conversation. And real quick, I'm sorry to sure. bring you to the present, but uh, the president of the United States has said that the British intelligence and the general headquarters cooperated in the plan to wiretap Trump Towers based on the Obama asking him to. Is that at all possible? Could that possibly happen? Or does he not know what he's talking about? Well, thanks for that question. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so actually, uh, President Trump didn't say that. Uh, there was a commentator on Fox News, Judge Napolitano, who quoted, I think, three intelligence sources that, that uh, said that was the case, um, and I've worked with uh, with GCHQ and the UK for most of my 40 years in this business. That is categorically not realistic. It's uh, it would be it would be um, incredible folly on their part, and it's not something that they would do. Besides the fact that it's illegal for us to do things for them that break their laws, and illegal for them to do things for us that break our laws. And so uh, it, it's wrong on on every front to include. Um, they would they would just actually refuse to do it if they were asked, but they wouldn't be asked. I can ask people to turn your placard over if you have a question. And Tony. I'd like to raise a topic for potential discussion. Now, for background, I go back to disinformatia back in the Soviet days. Many criminal organizations and, and state actors get into our databases for the purposes of stealing data. Um, and they've done that fairly effectively with not as much manipulation of the residual data left in the database, although that is thought of as a possible future. What I'd like to raise is a more subtle impact and perhaps more dangerous from an overall national security standpoint of eroding the confidence that we have in our data. Could you address that issue? Sure. Um, it's something that, that we do worry about. It's something that um, I can't get into specifics, but we've, we've seen maybe indications that, that that might be going on in some places. But it's not, um, uh, it's not widespread uh, at this point, and it's actually harder than it sounds um, to do it and to actually remain undetected. It's like if you've ever been involved in a, um, a deception operation. Deception operations are very difficult. They take a lot of work, a lot of planning, and a lot of care and maintenance. And so. Um, in that sense, it's it's actually it's something we care about a lot uh, and look for, um, but uh, and acknowledge is a real potential threat. Anything to add on integrity? 
Uh, Ellen. Thanks, John. Uh, Rick, a couple of questions for you. In um, January, the intelligence community put out its unclassified report on, the, on, on Russian interference, and the FBI and CIA had high confidence that uh, Putin intended to help uh, Trump win, and the NSA had only moderate conf confidence. What was what's behind the only moderate level of confidence? And then I have a second question. So without getting into the classified details, that was just an analytic uh, disagreement uh, between mm -hmm. um, our analysts and their analysts in terms of the, um, of, the uh, of the conclusion that was reached in the discussion of the classified sources. And so we had a long discussion about that uh, up to and including with, uh, uh, with Admiral Rogers, and he was comfortable with that, uh, with that assessment. And uh, so we you know, talked to CIA, FBI, and the DNI about that, and they were all comfortable. That's actually a strength of our analytic uh, uh, discipline and our analytic rigor uh, uh, these days, and the DNI's had a key role in that, but is making sure that when there are dissenting opinions that those are captured in the document. So that actually is, I think, a, a model for how analysis is supposed to work. And, and can you elaborate a little bit more on Lazarus and, and the, uh, the bank heist by uh, nation state? And first time you've ever seen that, right? And how significant is it? Yeah, so, so the, um, you know, again, going back to the Sony Pictures Entertainment uh, destructive uh, attack, that was, you know, categorically the North Korean government, and we uh, were very public about that, both the Bureau uh, and the government writ large uh, in 2014. Um, and what's happened is, based on the, the artifacts around the Bangladesh uh, bank attack, and I believe some other uh, bank uh, thefts as well, um, they were able to tie that forensically uh, to that same group that the cybersecurity uh, industry was. I can't remember the specific uh, um, companies, but there were, there were a couple of them that said, no, no, this is the same group. So if that's true, if that, if that uh, provenance of the data is true, then that to me, says that the North Koreans are robbing banks. Do you believe it to be true? Uh, I, I, am, I am optimistic about the truth of that. <laughs> How's that? Okay. Right, uh, Mark. Um, thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Aspen and Walter, for organizing the dialogue. I do want to raise a point that oftentimes comes up in uh, cybersecurity discussion. You have an important exchange uh, between government agencies and business groups, but of course the information at interest in many of the cybersecurity matters actually concerns individuals. It's their credit reports, it's their government background investigations, uh, it may be, even be their voting records. And our concern always in the development of policy in this area is some risk, let's say, of kind of an inside agreement between the government agencies and the private companies. This issue came up, for example, in the Cybersecurity Information uh, Sharing Act and the access to web logs of, of private companies. So um, my question is simply this. To, to what extent do you feel that you're able to pursue policies, both at the agency and at the bureau, that really prioritize the interests of individual American citizens, consumers, internet users and voters, which may not be quite the same as a, as a business asset that's under attack from a foreign adversary. Um, again, we operate rigorously within the framework of our laws and uh, everything uh, that we do within the Department of Justice. Um, I think it comes back to trust in part, uh, the trust relationships. One of the things that, that things that concerns me is the underreporting. I feel like based on what I see in the work that we do, that there's a huge degree of underreporting of incidents and attacks and things like that because likely people, businesses are concerned about uh, being exposed and harm to reputation or economic loss or a financial uh, impact. And that's what we're, that's the message and what we're working hard to overcome. Uh, I think we've proven ourselves in terms of uh, cases that we've pursued both behind the scenes and those that we've worked collaboratively with companies and people on to go 
out front, as in the Yahoo case, we've proven that we can maintain that trust and protect individuals and companies um, when those are, those are the expectations of the parties involved and the situation uh, warrants that. And um, I just think we need to continue to work hard at that, as I've already said, to build those relationships, to have that type of outreach uh, in order to encourage people and companies to better report and capture that because ultimately that will put us in a better position collectively to counter the threat and work against it. So if I can, uh, if I can add that from an NSA point of view, um, you know, uh, from the privacy side, first off, um, we don't need personally identifiable information to do the things that we need to do. We care about threat vectors. We care about malware. We care about you know, cyber actor infrastructure. We care about plans, intentions, and capabilities. Those sorts of things. We're not interested in, in you know, credit card numbers of citizens and things like that. I mean, we want, like to stop bad guys from taking them. We're interested in that way, but not in, in the actual substance of it. So we actually don't want that privacy information. And in the information sharing that we've set up with DHS, we work to sh help them shred that out to, to basically filter privacy relevant information out of what we, what we uh, exchange back and forth. Um, the other side is uh, interest in protecting uh, people's um, uh, information in their systems. And so th we do that through our information assurance mission where we publish and have published for a long time the top 10 things you can do to secure your network. It's, you know, common sense things like patch your systems, application whitelisting. There's a, if you go to IED.gov, it tells you that. You go to SANS.org, it says basically the same thing in 20 steps, but it's the same sort of information that lets you protect your, um, your uh, information from, uh, from as, you know, as many threats as possible. Many emerging technologies, usually the legal tools, are behind the norms. And, and this is, I think, following along that trend where we're hearing a lot of frustration with the, the pace at which the legal system is not able to keep, keep up with the non-state actors. Um, there's been discussion of the negative non-state actors, so criminals, terrorists, those that just want to in introduce chaos, uh, WikiLeaks, Anonymous, various others. What about cultivation of positive non-state actors? So citizen watch type communities, and what role can governments or those that are currently in control of sort of at the nation state level do to help cultivate that type of civ uh, ci civil society response and a positive norm enforcement? I'm just going to re-ask the question. The, uh, no, but Paul, but maybe one way to, to uh, start to address that would talk about uh, InfraGuard, um, the I ISAC uh, programs, and if there are any others out there today that you think are helpful at establishing norms for better behavior. Um, I, first of all, I think it's a phenomenal idea to establish communities like that. It all goes back to, you know, educating our communities and our citizens uh, so that they have an awareness of the type of threats that exist out there and what to look for in terms of, you know, suspicious activity, suspicious behavior, which is even harder to detect in the, uh, you know, the cyber and the online uh, forums. As John mentioned, yes, we, we have uh, our, you know, business, public private sector business associations that we uh, sponsor uh, from the FBI standpoint that would include InfraGuard. Um, the uh, Domestic Security Alliance Council. So that's for, you know, companies uh, and businesses, uh, private sector institutions uh, uh, predominantly. But um, I think, you know, that, that helps. It goes toward what we've been talking, what I've been speaking about up here in terms of forming those relationships and um, encouraging to the greatest degree possible that two-way uh, trusted information sharing. Um, we have a lot of resources available uh, online as well. Rick made reference to some of that uh, within our uh, FBI.gov. Um, you'll find uh, a volume of resources and educational materials related to uh, cybersecurity and protecting yourself online. Also in our uh, IC3.com.com platform that can be found in there and DHS as well has a, a pretty good volume of materials on there that can help people educate themselves and be in the best position to spot these things uh, and report them. 
What's the view of the FBI and, and, and NSA to, to follow up on bug bounty um, programs and so-called white hat uh, hackers? So I think uh, bug bounty uh, can be a good thing if it's if it's done uh, well. Um, the Department of Defense did it uh, uh, last year and uh, was was pretty successful in that. Um, I think you know you want to um, to uh, register participants in some way and have a you know a disclosure path that's that's pretty clear. Um, I think, uh, but I think in general it's a it's a good thing. I. Uh, I can't let us uh, talk about what the private sector could be empowered to do without turning to Stuart Baker. <laughs> Listen to the podcast, to the Stepped Up Cyber Law podcast. We have an hour long debate on that topic that we just put out today. Uh, so I won't repeat all of that. I do have a question for you, John, though. For future questions, no advertising. Uh, <laughs> I, so, Lost amid the welter of, oh, you know, it wasn't Trump Tower that was tapped, and you don't spell wiretap with two Ps, um, it, it has been the fact that there is a serious point here that the president ought to be making, which is that uh, a, a president of a different party supporting his opponent decided to open an investigation, which I would have been opened as well, but nonetheless, decided to open an investigation into Russian interference with the election that was bound to focus disproportionately on the Trump campaign, uh, since we all knew uh, that the Russians hated the, uh, uh, the Democratic candidate. Uh, and then, despite the protections for the anonymity of Americans who got caught up in those uh, uh, intercepts uh, and the restrictions on leaking classified information, uh, information from that investigation was leaked in a very damaging way to the president's new team. Uh, he, he lost somebody that he had thought was going to be a valuable member of his team. Um, all of this happening while the other party is in control of the levers of power. Um, which, given that we're going to have this in 2020 and 2024 and 2028, uh, we're going to have investigations, we're going to have a situation in which uh, whoever is on the wrong side of being in power is going to believe that these investigations are going to lead to abuses. Uh, what more should we be doing? Obviously, the idea that these decisions are made by the highest levels of government is actually counterintuitive in this context. I mean, telling the president, oh, don't worry, you know, Obama didn't wiretap you, Sally Yates did, is not particularly comforting. Uh, so what should we do about additional safeguards in the context of these sorts of election interference uh, investigations? Um, and I'll turn to my two uh, <laughs> <laughs> colleagues, um, since I do get to ask the questions. But uh, I will say, um, just in terms of uh, factually there, I think what we heard yesterday was that the director of the FBI said that actually there was, uh, they had looked very hard and that there was no sign that that statement was true. So at the end of your um, question, you had talked about it wouldn't be comforting if Sally Yates had authorized the wiretapping of, of uh, now President Trump. But I think what you heard is that uh, no, there's been no evidence that anybody did no shred from anyone in, in government. Um, and to date, we haven't heard really an explanation as to why there was the uh, tweet about it. I'm not sure there's been further elaboration. We have two officials here today who could talk whether maybe there's some piece of evidence. John, can I just to interrupt? Yeah. Yes, uh, he was not tapped. But the taps and the investigation inevitably had a bigger impact on his campaign and the people on his campaign than on the other side that the president was supporting. So, I mean, uh, yes, he, he elided that like he always did. You have to take him seriously, but not literally all of that. Uh, uh, but, I, you know, it is not comforting to be told, yes, this investigation that was bound to have a bigger impact on you than on the Clinton campaign was started by a political appointee at the Justice Department. So that, that was the second part. Uh, I was going to get to just to correct on that factually, because I think in the first part of the question you had said the, uh, the president had decided to open an investigation into electoral interference, but uh, 
that's not how the system works. So it wouldn't be that the president would decide to open an investigation. In fact, there are a very careful set of processes and procedures. I'm going to turn to Paul a little bit in terms of the FBI, how they would open an investigation, the legal predicate, which gets reviewed by their general counsel's office. Then you have career officials in the National Security Division, if it's a national security investigation, or prosecutors who are also career officials who would make uh, investigative decisions as to whether or not you could use certain authorities to collect information. Then, to the extent that you wanted to do a wiretap of a U.S. person, we, we have had a system put in place as a reform to government abuse of those authorities in the creation through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of a system that does not permit anyone in the executive branch to unilaterally determine um, whether or not to surveil a U.S. person, but instead to go through either through the criminal process, through a judge, or through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And then you also have the oversight um, regime that's been set up through inspectors general and through the uh, House and Senate Intelligence Oversight Committees, also church committee uh, reforms in this, in this area. And so I think it's always a question to ask, and there actually has been a fair amount of scrutiny over the last several years over those oversight mechanisms. I know you've been uh, outspoken in defense of the rigor of those oversight um, mechanisms. So I, I, I'll turn over to um, uh, Rick and Paul to see what they have to add. Well, let me be clear up front. I'm not providing any comment or commentary on anything that you said. And I will <laughs> to refer entirely to Director Comey's <laughs> testimony from yesterday. Um, but I, I do think about it like this. You know, as, as John just did a great job of laying out, you know, the rules, regulations, authority, and law which we operate within, which is strict and rigorous uh, in terms of opening investigations and uh, getting approval uh, through probable cause uh, to do various surveillance techniques, and that's all public and well documented. I do think about this, though, in terms of, and this is everything, because everyone we treat under the law fairly and equally, and that's how we approach it. And I think about the future, and we would talk about future threats um, and specifically focusing on elections, um, political campaigns, candidates, I do think we need to take, this is obvious, the lessons learned from everything that's occurred and apply it in the future and apply the resources and training necessary for all individuals to best protect them and put them in the best position to protect themselves when we think about uh, everything going forward in the future. I agree with that. Uh, Betsy. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to return to uh, John, one of his earlier points about the cyber 911. Um, so I run a university-based think tank, and one of our roles is really to create a neutral platform where law enforcement folks can come speak to company folks about issues that we're seeing. And at one of the events we hosted, Folks came to us and essentially expressed that the problem with information sharing wasn't about FBI, it wasn't about DHS, it was about other enforcement agencies, the FTC, the FCC, who might look at the issues that are being presented and independently decide to undertake enforcement actions. And so I'm wondering, how do we create a whole of government approach to information sharing that takes into account all the different actors that are involved and create the incentive structures so that folks don't feel like by sharing information on one side, they might be subject to enforcement on the other. Thank you. So I, I think um, that's a great point. Um, and if you recall back when we were talking about the Cyber Information Sharing Act and the, and the run up to it and the actual enactment of legislation, we said this is a first step. It's not the end of the road for information sharing. I think what you're describing is exactly the kind of feedback we need to get into for the next version of that legislation to say, here are things, we've, we've experimented this for a couple of years now, we've learned some things, here's the, here's the good things that we should emphasize, here's the negative second and third order effects that we should minimize, and let's change the legislation to reflect that. I would say the same. I think it's a constantly evolving process, uh, and we just need to continue to adapt and, and, and evolve and take the lessons learned uh, 
from various incidents that we've faced and experienced so far. And it, it, like I said up front, just work harder to collaborate and coordinate between and amongst each other and the agencies so we can achieve better outcomes in the future. And uh, Willie. I just wanted to ask, you know, it seems like law enforcement in particular and the FBI really most of all have taken on such a huge burden in cyber in terms of being the lead in investigating and responding to the vast majority of cyber incidents, whether nation states, criminals, hacktivists, destructive data theft, data manipulation. Um, but, you know, as Rick mentioned earlier, a lot of the capability is in DOD. As Stuart loves to remind us, companies have a huge potential role to play. So, A, does FBI have the resources and authorities needed to take on the scope of mission that you have today? And B, if not, who can do more? And how would you like to see them do more? We kind of touched on this before um, in terms of the resources and funding. Um, I, uh, from the FBI standpoint, I feel like we have it, but I view it as a collective also. I don't feel like nothing that we do is on our own, even, even now. We do it, everything that we do, with our partners in the Department of Defense, with our partners at the NSA, the CIA, DHS, and the private sector all around. And uh, the other uh, group that we haven't mentioned here is our you know, foreign allies, particularly Five Eyes partners, are essential and vital to the work that we're doing across all threats. So um, I think for the FBI, we have what we need in terms of our agency's authorities uh, and the resources, although, again, it's always easy to ask for more, <laughs> more money, more personnel, whatever. But I don't think that that's the easy ask and the easy answer. I do think collectively um, that's where it's at. And we're doing that. I mean, in any the, all of the uh, cases, investigations, operations that we've referenced up here or been mentioned in the room, that's all work that we're doing together each and every day. Uh, and we do it with, with uh, Rick and his agency and John when he was in, in government. And um, we just have to continue to build on that and get better at it, particularly in the cyber world. Because I think, we're, I think we are when you just talk about ordinary law enforcement, ordinary crime, although, again, we, we hope that crime goes away, but we also recognize that that is probably not the reality of the situation. We just have to work hard to stop the threat and reduce it um, as much as we possibly can. Um, and it's even harder in the cyber world because of all of the challenges we mentioned, the anonymity, the globalization, the networking of adversaries and criminals and all of that. So um, it, it's just all about working better together and, you know, achieving more collectively with all the resources that we have. Let me push you a little bit on the, uh, I recognize that the FBI needs more resources. I'm saying that, not, uh, not Paul. You. But um, <laughs> but on this, uh, one thing you didn't mention, um, and I know Paul was one of the top and most trusted officials when it came to combating the terrorist threat. And one of the changes that was made there was to empower state and locals to be the tip of the spear, in part by making a concerted effort to increase the resources that went to state and uh, state and locals. Do state and locals have sufficient resources now to combat the cyber threat, and should we work to get them additional resources? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that's an area we can, uh, we can work at. Um, I, we, when we compare, you reference, you know, the counterterrorism efforts um, and the Joint Terrorism Task Force. We're building on that and have a model within the cyber programs as well. So we have uh, cyber threat task forces in all 56 of our field offices. And uh, that's a great point about our state and local partners, because again, that doesn't necessarily get into the national security realm so much. It might be more about the more traditional types of crimes that we've discussed here. But I think it can go across everything, uh, you know, given the victimization uh, that we've seen. So. Uh, it probably would, and we're working at this, be advantageous to recruit as we have and build out on the um, 
CT side and within the JTTFs do duplicate that further on the cyber side. We've done it to some extent, but it's not as mature as it is on the CT side between us all and within those task forces. So I think there's a lot of room to grow there, and I think we could make a lot of gains by leveraging that, much like we have in the counterterrorism uh, uh, approach. Um, why don't we, uh, JC? Hey, thanks again for inviting us and, and appreciate your thoughts up front. Uh, first to Ellen, we put out the paper on the SWIFT, uh, so happy to follow up with that. We have a high degree of confidence. Uh, so uh, the, the other thing relative to the type of threats, we're starting to see a, an acceleration in the complexity of the threats and an availability in the black market of what used to be nation state level capabilities. So now what used to be assigned to a nation state is now up for grabs and up for the right price. Uh, one, can you talk about what's causing the accelerant? And two, how do you decrease that accelerant as we uh, see the malware starting to expand in its lethality and its complexity to detect? So I think uh, a couple of factors that relate to the acceleration of that. One, it's profitable. So cybercrime is profitable. Um, the, the criminal groups and criminal actors have access to a lot of money. And they're smart. They're using that to hire high-end computer science graduates out of school or hire them away from other companies and build high-end tools that are equivalent to, to nation-state tools. I think that's one thing. I think another thing is, um, and there was reference to it earlier about the Russians and the bleed over between the state and the criminal actors. And so the state actor who takes his knowledge of capabilities and tools into the criminal world and now you've sort of you know, breached, if there was a membrane, you've breached that membrane between those, those two environments. And so, um, so, so that um, uh, does it as well. Yeah, I did. One thought I had off of that, I agree with uh, Rick, but another huge challenge that we face and we need all of your help uh, with is just recruiting and retention. You know, get, finding, bringing on board, you know, the right talent, the right individuals with the skills and expertise to bring into our agencies and departments to fight the threat. And that's often challenging uh, because it's more lucrative often <laughs> to go into the private sector um, but, uh, you know, we, we need exceptional people with the right skills, talents, and expertise um, to join with us to help fight these threats and the adversaries that seek to do us harm. If I can piggyback on that, one thing that I think is a critical national imperative um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because it's the right thing to do, but, but more importantly, it's the, it gives us the right kind of mission outcomes that we want, and that is getting more women and minorities into STEM fields and starting at the junior high school, grade school levels to overcome the social barriers that, uh, that prevent them getting into to those, um, uh, those tracks, those, those programs. Um, with the National Science Foundation, we offer something called Gen Cyber. We did close to 200 camps last year where we bring teachers and students together and give them a week of cyber training and try to spark their interest in that. Um, uh, we've gotten to, I want to say, 54,000 people uh, around the country that way. But, um, but you're starting to see that reflected in university um, major selection and graduations at schools like Stanford and MIT and Maryland and Carnegie Mellon, where, where half the graduating class is now female. That's huge, because if we don't do that, we're, we're carving off over half of the available workforce out of the cybersecurity field. And so it's, it's the right thing to do, and it's something that we have to do to fix our, uh, our recruiting problem. Uh, David? Hi, thanks for doing this. Uh, we haven't seen a final executive order yet on cybersecurity from the White House. I understand there's been some debate going on there about what should be in it. Uh, and one of the questions seems to be whether there should be some kind of a standing order about how the U.S. would respond to a cyber attack from, from another nation state or from an outside actor. Would it be useful in terms of deterrence to have such a kind of a, a standing uh, response that, we, that people could expect? Or could it box the U.S. in? Um, could, it, uh, could it raise questions about the whole problem of attribution, um, knowing just who did it? So I think um, uh, it could be useful, but it's also, as you said, could be dangerous uh, because if somebody knows I've got, you know, 
hey, if you do this, I'm going to I'm going to whack you in this way. Uh, then, um, okay, great. So someone who wanted you to do that would pretend to be another nation state actor and, and do things. As I said before, deception is hard, but it's not impossible. And attribution is also hard, but not impossible. And actually, it's, it's not as hard as you might think, but it's hard to do in a timely way and in an actual way where you can release publicly the reason for the attribution. Because usually attribution of nation state actors involves some fairly sensitive intelligence sources and methods. And if you disclose those, then guess what? You're, they're not going to be there next time you need them. So, so you're sort of caught in this, in this um, dilemma uh, in that space. But, but I think there's potentially value there, but you have to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't allow people to, to you know, uh, punch you and have you punch John because you think he did it. Evan? So uh, yesterday, uh, Sean Spicer had a pretty rough day at the podium, but one of the few things, one of the things that he said that was truthful about what happened uh, in the, in the uh, DNC hack situation was you had a victim that in 2015 was, was notified, was, you know, the FBI went to them and, and said what, what had been detected, uh, I think with the help of, of Rick and other agencies. Um, and the victim did not respond. And multiple attempts, uh, the victim just did not respond in the way that one would expect to respond, especially with a situation that we now know became a, a matter of national interest, national security. So the question is, I guess, if we're looking forward to 2018, 2020, the director talked a little bit about this yesterday, um, what do you do with a victim uh, that, again, you know, in the, in the moment, perhaps we don't understand the, the, the scope of things, uh, but the victim does not respond in, in the way that you guys think they should respond, and, and, and what do you do about that? Again, I'm not commenting on that K-7. It's an ongoing investigation. But uh, I think it, it goes back to what we already said. It's educating people, working ha hard at it, um, you know, we often theoretically find uncooperative victims, but they're victims nonetheless. Um, we encounter that, you know, quite a bit where we're detecting things and going out and informing people, businesses, organizations, whatever. And um, sometimes we find a lack of cooperation or a resistance. It could be for a variety of reasons. And we work hard to work through that and inform people and warn them and, you know, protect them or attempt to protect them. But I think it goes back to, again, a lot of what we've talked about here already, uh, educating people generally about the threat that's out there and the ways it can come at you and building trust and setting examples where we've had successes uh, in achieving the outcomes, good positive outcomes that we want. Just to follow up on that question, if it's what if it's critical infrastructure, it's the electrical grid, or like we saw with the Iranian-affiliated uh, actors, they've accessed the sluice control systems of a dam and they could flood an area or a nuclear provider. Should, do you have the authorities you need if a victim in that case is not taking the necessary steps that could end up costing serious loss of life or injury or property damage? Yeah, I, I believe that we do through um, through DHS and through uh, uh, other um, sector-specific agencies that are responsible for um, the different components of critical infrastructure. If if not actual legal compellence, certainly they can lean hard and make them pay attention uh, more than they might uh, otherwise. And what about as we move towards the Internet of Things? Um, is that an area where you have the sufficient authorities to build in things like security by design, whether it's the uh, pacemakers in our hearts, the cars on our roads, the drones in the sky, or just uh, uh, 80 million unencrypted devices that you can turn into a botnet? Do you have the authorities you need where you see the harm being caused, but you can't cause the, the victim to take protective action? 
I would I look at that more, John, on the sort of risk vulnerability side. I believe that we have the authorities we need to carry out our role and responsibilities in, in terms of protecting people in this country. Um, I, I would say with respect to the Internet of Things, that obviously widens and deepens and, and broadens the range of risk vulnerabilities in ways that the bad actors can come in and potentially uh, attack us. That's, I, in my, this is what I think about it. I think it's probably an area that uh, crosses over <laughs> many different uh, industries and sectors and it's ripe for probably regulation uh, in order to achieve the proper standards um, to better put better protections in place with regard to way, the interoperability and the risks that are associated with that. Yeah, I think, um, yikes. Um, I think also there's, there's a market aspect here. Um, so, so for example, you know, I don't allow cellular devices in my, in my buildings um, because of the threat, the technical threat that they pose. And yet, I am going to have, if I don't already have employees who need to wear internet aware, um, cellular aware uh, medical devices. So I have to figure out how to do that both from a, from a protect point of view and then as a foreign intelligence agency, I want to be able to address uh, the potential to use uh, use um, Internet of Things devices for uh, for foreign intelligence collection, um, but I, I would say you know the government can can provide some guidance. Although I think us providing a lot of detailed guidance is probably not a good idea because um, we tend to mess it up because because nobody knows the problems better than the people who are in the industry with the specific uh, the specific um, areas that we're talking about. But, but I do think that uh, what we're not seeing is any market demand for security as a feature on these products. And so you get, you know, Nest cameras and other things with, with um, you know, essentially no security. And that's the Mirai botnet that was used to attack Dyne and by second order effect a whole bunch of uh, public services um, used, used things like that. Now, there are a couple of, of initial efforts to get lightweight crypto on some of those devices, and that's going to that's gonna help. But... What I've, what I've seen is consumers aren't demanding it and companies have a need to get products to market quickly, often in competition with other folks, and the cost of engineering out vulnerabilities in software and hardware is pretty high. And if you, you, know, if you, lose, if you lose that opportunity to get in the market, your competitor beats you out, guess what, you're out of business. So you have a perfectly secure product that no one's gonna be able to buy. Um, so, so, so I don't know how to fix that problem. I don't, I'm pretty sure the government clamping down on it is not the answer to that. Uh, Dustin. It's a question for the deputy director. Uh, everyone's favorite law came up earlier, FISA, thanks to the question from our good friend Stuart. Um, Section 702 of FISA is due to expire at the end of this year. Uh, lawmakers from both parties have, um, for years now, asked for an estimate of the number of Americans whose communications are incidentally collected under 702 programs. Um, it appears that NSA and others have been working on trying to develop this and, and provide it to lawmakers ahead of this expiration. Uh, and they say that without it, it they won't be able to have a full debate, uh, a public debate on the uh, efficacy of this program and, um, and the drawbacks. Do you agree that an estimate of Americans is important to provide to lawmakers and the public? And are you confident that one will be provided before the end of the year? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so we were working on that, and as you said, they have been working on that for a while. Um, it's, it's complicated, and so, uh, you know, the, um, uh, if I show you um, an email address, if you, so we're back to 702. So 702 is the law that lets us um, collect against a foreign entity overseas that happens to be using U.S. infrastructure. Um, and in the course of that communication, targeting that foreign entity, they may be uh, either uh, in contact with or reference a U.S. person communications identifier that then is what we call incidental collection. Um, it could be that they're having a conversation with that person about their terrorist plot to blow up, you know, uh, uh, some building. It could be that they just happen to be, you know, caught up in the, in the, uh, in the collection. Um, but our focus is not the U.S. entity. Our focus is the foreign entity. And so when I see an email address that let's say is, uh, you know, bob at gmail.com, well, who's Bob? If he's not the target of my communications or it's not clear from the content there, then I don't know who Bob is. And so am I going to then do what I'm specifically not supposed to do under FISA, which is 
investigate this individual who's not the foreign intelligence target to see who they are, to see if they're a U.S. person or not. So we're caught a little bit in a, in a dilemma. We're working through that with, uh, with the Congress, and we'll get to a satisfactory resolution um, because we have to. The 702 program is critically important to, uh, to our foreign intelligence mission and also to the other uh, folks in the government like the Bureau that use that, uh, that information. Um, and as part of that, um, part of that um, uh, work towards reauthorizing the statute, we are in the final stages of putting out some uh, unclassified vignettes, about 20 of them, that talk about the use of 702 in different uh, different scenarios. So. Do you know when we'll have numbers? Is that what I don't. Uh, Paul, how important is 702 to the FBI's cyber program? Is it something that you use? Yeah, we uh, we rely upon that heavily. It's vital and essential to the work that we do in the cyber arena and also, uh, as you know, counterterrorism. And uh, Sean. Yeah, thank you. Um, just as a preliminary remark, it's always so wonderful to see lawyers uh, uh, at work, and um, it's perhaps a measure of the uh, state the administration's in that even Stuart can't make a good case for them. Um, my question is about vulnerability uh, disclosure, zero days. So, so once you guys have been through the process, um, you've said we're going to keep this one or this group of ones, what happens if you get information that that uh, set of tools has been compromised? And what's the timeline there? I'm particularly interested in, you know, how, how quickly agencies are supposed to get off the blocks in terms of notifying vendors when they're aware that a compromise of a tool might have, might have happened? So, so at NSA, we have uh, two processes we go through. One's an internal process where we have a, um, uh, a hardware or software vulnerability. We go through a set of, uh, of questions that we, that we ask ourselves. Um, it's represented by both the foreign intelligence side and the information assurance side that participate in that. The actual process internally is run by the information assurance side. Um, and they look at things like how widespread is the vulnerability, how significant is it, is it something that shows up in critical national security systems, in critical infrastructure, is it widespread in the, uh, in the public, um, or is it something that's very narrow and specialized. And it's things like... Um, um, is, it, uh, is it something that requires, you know, nation state capabilities, an army of supercomputers to, to exploit, or is it something that you could do with a, with a, uh, a lower end uh, set of capabilities? Um, is it something that is only uh, doable with physical access, or can it be a remote uh, vulnerability? So all those things um, come into play. We then make a decision internally at NSA to say, retain the vulnerability or disclose the vulnerability. And our historic numbers are about 90%, actually a little bit more than 90% in favor of disclosure. Um, and then for those things, since 2014, for those things that are in, that we put in the retain category, they then go to a National Security Council-led process called the Vulnerability, vulnerability Equities Review Process that um, we get participation from across the interagency, so Commerce, State, the Bureau participates, other folks do, where we uh, go through a similar process and they weigh in from their perspectives, and then a decision is made, disclose or retain. If the decision is made to retain and the vulnerability becomes publicly known, then obviously we would, uh, we would disclose that. We would also work with, quietly behind the scenes, with the relevant companies to explain, here's what we know, and here is, uh, you know, because there's, there's vulnerabilities, and then there's exploitation of those vulnerabilities, and it's not trivial sometimes to convert a vulnerability into an exploit. And so if that's the case, where we have a vulnerability that we develop an exploit for and it's disclosed, we'll work with a software or hardware manufacturer to help them understand how the exploit works so they can patch it quickly. I'm, I'm sorry, just to follow up, what happens if it hasn't been disclosed publicly, but you have reason to believe that it's been compromised perhaps by a, a, uh, an adversary intelligence service. What, what would you do then? So again, that's a conversation that whoever owns that, uh, that vulnerability would have internally and then it would uh, go through the, um, the equities review process. But it's basically, uh, you know, is it? So would it go, go back to the NSC then for, for who, who makes the decision, hey, we think the Russians have stolen this yeah. stuff, yeah. we ought to get in touch with Cisco? So to disclose, agencies make uh, the decision to, and they'll, you know, coordinate with each other, to retain, and it gets elevated. 
We only have time for two more questions. I, I do think that there's a, a couple of minutes afterwards for reporters. So I'm going to focus on the, uh, the two last questions for non-reporter members of the roundtable. And then I think our guests have some time to answer your questions briefly uh, <laughs> after the event. But I want to keep to our rule of ending on time at the Aspen Institute. So Tom. Yes, I wanted to follow up on a point you made, Rick, about the um, National Cybersecurity Center in the UK and the integrative agility you said. Um, what, what advantages do you see that a uh, similar model or um, uh, that we, we could in, uh, create here? What advantages do you see that would have in terms of shared services, information sharing and the like? Uh, what would the ideal model look like in your eyes? So I think what the NCSC does that I think is valuable, it's a single voice from the government to the private sector, critical infrastructure from the private sector in terms of, uh, you know, here's what you should do for, for security. You don't have a lot of different opinions. And, and they were in the case uh, where they had people actually in the government giving conflicting advice, you know, within different uh, parts of the government. So, so it addresses that. It also um, helps with defensive responses. It speeds the agility in terms of defensive responses because, you, you know, the way it works now, um, if we're doing something that's outside national security systems and say the Bureau or DHS wants, uh, wants assistance, there's a, there's a legal document called a request for technical assistance that comes in that flows up through their channel, then over to the DOD channel, then down to us, and then goes back up. And so there's lots of time spent moving paper around between lawyers that I think is more uh, properly spent um, you know, on site um, addressing issues. We have, we have adversaries that move at cyber speed, and we move at policy speed. Mm -hmm. And that's just not a, it, it, it makes what's not a fair fight even less fair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that anything that can achieve all of those objectives and get us better is worth looking at and considering. And our, uh, our last question, Tim. It's a weird quirk of cyber conflict, unlike traditional conflict, that we oftentimes have nation state actors who are attacking private sector entities instead of nation state to nation state um, conflict. We've had long-standing rules of war in traditional conflict, and to my mind, very little has been done to develop similar normative structures uh, in the world that we're in, and yet we've spent most of the hour, talk, hour and a half talking about attacks on entities here in the United States, which are seen by foreign entities as proxies for US national security. In fact, Rick, I think you articulated that it was the, you know, part of the US national security interest to, to protect and defend those companies, and I would agree, of course. My question to both of you is what can or should be done uh, to develop a similar sort of normative structure to say that certain things in, in cyber conflict in the future are out of bounds, and, and certainly that civilian entities are, in fact, civilian or not part of the U.S. government or other foreign governments in the future. So I think, I think there's efforts that have been going on for a while between things like the UN uh, Government Group of Experts, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, is that what SCO stands for? Um, uh, there's, there's a fundamental, and uh, you know, State Department's work on norms of, uh, international norms of behavior, the Tallinn Manual just came out with their version 2.0. All those things are, are uh, steps down that path. They're not moving very quickly. They're not moving nearly as quickly as the technology and the, you know, artful use of that technology for things that we might not agree with. Um, and there's a, there's a bigger issue underlying that, which is there are fundamentally different views of the internet and the global communications network between countries like Russia and China and North Korea and Iran and countries like us, the UK, Australia, uh, other countries that, that are you know, what we would call uh, Western, uh, Western style democracies, um, where they, you know, one of our core uh, issues is freedom of speech, you know, ability to express yourself on the internet. That's one of their core issues to control is freedom of speech, ability to express yourself because they don't want people to say bad things about their government and inspire revolution. So, so I mean, that's one of the things I think has been slowing this down, this fact that we've got this shared space, but we have two poles in that space that are pulling in opposite directions. So, so you, you can't get agreement at the basic level and that makes it hard to get agreement on things that would build on the base. Yeah, agree with that. And then also, I think um, in the world we're in today and everything we've talked about, everything we've faced, we're, we're learning and finding the way in terms of the appropriate balance to achieve those norms. As we've talked about, um, 
our response to the attacks we've faced in terms of the tools we've employed, whether it's sanctions, indictments, arrests, uh, in consideration of further actions, we're, 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 we're trying to strike that balance and find that right balance to push back on our adversaries and cause our adversaries to um, sort of right set and not come at us that way so that we can pr prevent that from happening. And uh, we're certainly not there yet because obviously things are continuing to happen and we're going to keep, keep working on it to get there. I want to thank all the members of the round table uh, today. We've certainly identified that this is uh, an enormous area of threat and one where we don't have all the solutions. And for two people who are in the fight, one of whom not for too much, too much longer on this end of it, but uh, who've been in the fight for uh, their entire careers at trying to make our lives safer. I want to thank them both for their participation today. Give them a round of applause.